Our guest speaker today is Dr. Mei-Ling Loco, who is currently an assistant professor at the Yale School of Architecture, um, where her research focuses on ecological design, integrated material life cycle design, and the broad development and evaluation of renewable bio-based um, materials. So she is from Ghana and the Philippines and works with agro-waste and renewable bio-based materials. Through her work, she explores themes of generative justice through the development of new modes of distributed production and collaboration. In her research and design practice, her work deconstructs historical narratives and practices of extraction through the design of new material vocabularies and the prototyping of participatory models of distributed production. Okay. Uh, she's previously taught at the Cooper Union and Rensselaer Polytechnic, where she served as the director of the Building Sciences Program, as well as assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Center for Architecture, Science, and Ecology, otherwise known as CASE. Um, Laco holds a PhD and Master of Science in Architectural Science, Ooh, that's, yeah, <laughs> from the Center for Architecture, Science, and Ecology at Rensselaer, and a BA from Tufts University. So let's uh, welcome Mei-Ling Lako. Perfect, okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's kind of weird, apparently, standing here so the live stream can also see me, but I'll try. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I think I was here about nine or ten years ago. Um, so it's great to be back. It was a very engaging audience back then, and I'm sure it's even better now. Um, but I'd like to share and talk about um, my research um, both at Yale at the Center for Ecosystems in Architecture, also known as ELC, and as part of my startup, um, Willow, which is based in Accra, Ghana. Okay, sorry. So um, last September, we, um, with a, a group of wonderful experts from architecture, engineering and construction, um, from forestry, from different, um, material systems uh, came out with a report that had as its objective to put buildings on the climate agenda, on the global climate agenda. And if you guys wanna read it, there's a QR code over there. You can also just Google it, building materials and the climate. And you know, this is not a surprise to anyone, but you know, primarily where we are today is you know, primarily dominated by mineral-based materials, um, concrete, uh, we know it takes the majority share at 36%. When we put that together with steel, both these materials dominate 60% of all CO2 emissions on the planet, brick following um, at 18%, and things like renewable materials like wood is just a sliver, about 2%. Two, 2 and one of the most controversial parts of the report was this diagram, um, which is really a, a call to action around how we might shift our practices in the built environment, particularly about what we're building with. Um, and you can kind of see where, you know, we have bio-based by ma uh, mass actually is, you know, quite a small percentage um, over here, actually climbing to close to 50% of everything that we build with. Um, so this is incredibly political. And it is also demanding us to scale in a way that might have good and anticipated uh, consequences. And so I wanted to sort of concentrate my um, lecture today on you know, that challenge. And I'm gonna probably briefly talk about five dilemmas, more, more questions, um, which might um, frame some projects that I'll talk about. Um, but you know, the sort of message behind the report was really this, three-part strategy, which had to do with avoid. How do we build with less? We've heard a lot about how to build, you know, with circular principles, extend the life of our buildings and our materials um, to some degree, 
um, so that we can really reduce carbon. Um, with all our conventional building materials, there's so much opportunity to improve. So it has a lot to do with material efficiency, improving recycling and reuse. And on the green part, which is you know where I'm super interested in, is how do we shift to bio-based building materials? And um, you know we've sort of seen over the history of our carbon dynamics on the planet, um, sort of a long period of carbon pool formation. You know when um, the atmospheric carbon in the air sort of decreased, and we saw all of that carbon stored in carbon pools like the land. And we know right around the Industrial Revolution, we sort of started to extract mineral materials as well as fossil fuels um, in order to power and build our cities. And so in that red line, that red dotted line is sort of where we are right now. And there's a huge opportunity to sort of transition to bio-based sources of construction, which really means you know, regenerative practices where we're actually growing at pace to supply the building materials we need but also improving circularity across um, all the materials that we use today. And so this has a lot to do with you know, um, working with renewable sources. Um, in the report, we chose these flagships um, because we think number one, timber is sort of the big brother leading the way. Um, people are used to building with timber. We've seen huge advances in you know, mass timber cross-laminated uh, timber technologies, especially in terms of replacing primary structure. Um, bamboo falling very closely behind. It's a much faster growing plant um, and particularly in places in the global south could really address a whole number of applications from structures to laminated products um, uh, and the like. And biomass, which comes from a whole inventory of, of um, industries, um, primarily agriculture where um, we essentially have a ton of residues that come out of farming that can be used. Um, instead of burning them or prematurely downcycling them, they might have a better life um, in the building um, for a period of time. Um, this can also come from forest detritus or um, invasive species, which are rapidly proliferating, um, you know, particularly around urban areas. So bio-based building materials have this triple capacity. We, we think of it as a triple heavyweight in terms of carbon reduction. And excuse the really technical diagram, but I uh, just wanted to show the first two on this. And the first has to do with the fact that as plants grow, they take carbon dioxide out of the air. And so that carbon sequestration potential, particularly when we have very fast growing plants, have this, this um, as part of their life cycle and opportunities to sequester carbon um, actively. And if we actually um, transition them into high value applications as opposed to burning or putting them in paper products um, or downcycling them as fertilizers into agriculture again, we could store them in buildings, buying ourselves some time, this sort of flat line, um, until we're ready to emit, we can control the emission of, of CO2. So that carbon storage or that carbon sink potential has become a huge uh, mandate across a number of countries around the world. Um, and lastly, we also know that um, relative to other types of bio-based building materials, we might have the opportunity to actually affect operational carbon. So all of the energy caught up in heating, cooling, and ventilating our buildings, all of these materials can be designed in such a way that they can passively reduce loads. They may actively buffer moisture, um, as well as cool buildings through intrinsic evaporative cooling. So this triple opportunity is something that um, we're trying to ensure that we understand that we're teaching and, and our students understand that, but also how do we show fantastic projects that make the use of these materials um, something that is aspirational. So this is where, you know, um, I'm sort of uh, meeting a few dilemmas, and I wanted to outline them and talk about three projects that have over time started to address these. The first is the, um, around how much can we grow. Um, timber as the big brother, we've seen that demand sort of build, not as much as steel and concrete, but we know today that our rates of deforestation outpaced afforestation, and the historic patterns of ext extracting timber have grossly disproportionately um, disadvantaged a lot of tropical forests around the world um, where um, they may not have the policy or 
resources to actually a forest relative to the global north. Um, and so aside from trees, are there other sources of biomass? And the second dilemma is something we always hear. Is there enough on the planet in terms of biomass to actually supply um, you know, our building industry given the kind of scale we're, and for demand that we're gonna see? There's a fantastic study done um, by a bunch of researchers from ETAHA and collaborating institutions that really looks at two flagship materials and we can kind of see straw and bamboo um, and strategically looking at bamboo for structural applications in the global south, straw for insulation in the global north. You can kind of see, you know, in the darker blue and green, the supply of these materials and the demand in the lighter colors. And what's interesting to see is that in almost every continent or bioregion around the world, supply actually is far much more than demand. In the Pacific region, it's on an order of about you know, five. Um, in South Asia, you can kind of see the supply of bamboo being really um, interesting as a potential product in, in that ecosystem. In the Western European Union, um, straw you know, can be a huge source, especially when you think of retrofit applications where we're trying to insulate buildings. Um, a lot of my work has focused on agricultural residues. Um, I primarily looked at this because um, of the longstanding trade in terms of extracting low value agricultural produce from parts of, around the world, including Africa, um, and the fact that we actually import a lot of high value materials to actually build with. One of the byproducts that is left from agriculture is husks, stems, rinds, stalks. Um, and these are fantastic materials that, you know, if you think about everything that a plant has to do to condition the fruit, the supple fruit um, in its lifetime, um, all of the protective and nutrient moisture transfer um, uh, mechanisms that happen in those materials are actually incredibly useful in buildings. Think about thatch um, and a lot of breathable building materials that we've built with for thousands of years. And we know this is intricately tied with our growth as a species. So the more we grow, the more food we're producing, the more this material resource is generated. Uh, in 2019, so we're close to over 10 billion now, we produce about 9.4 billion tons of um, plant material of which only 60% makes its way to our plates. 40% um, is lost all along the, the life cycle. And so that might be a fantastic resource, you know, that can be used particularly in places where populations are growing. The third dilemma is when we actually looked at a huge survey of the agricultural residues that we have around the world, we see that over half of everything we grow today for food is one of four plants, sugar, corn, rice, and wheat. Soy is following closely behind. It's gonna be the fifth super crop. But um, you know, if we think about the fact that we're depending on monoculture biomass to supply our building boom, um, we have a serious problem because we already see the impacts of large scale monoculture agriculture the minute we're gonna attach the building material life cycle, which has huge pressures, moves much quicker, um, we're gonna see exacerbating effects, um, not just on um, biodiversity loss, but when we actually look at the labor systems embedded in sugar, for example, we see the prototyping of all sorts of inequities around labor, You know, thinking of slavery to begin with, that really began hand in hand with, with sugar on the scale that we see today. The fourth is, you know, there, there's many ways to um, make bio-based materials. And in the course of doing this report, we were shocked by one of the most um, detailed studies around laminated bam um, bamboo products. Um, you can kind of see on above uh, the, the, the y-axis in gray, the emissions, the carbon emissions associated with lumber engineered lumber, steel, cement, timber, hempcrete, and the storage potentials of the bio-based materials. It's shocking to see that laminated bamboo has almost equivalent the CO2 emissions of steel. And that is because we are spending a ton of energy actually 
um, treating the material through chemicals to prevent corrosion, to improve its resistance to all sorts of mic microbial activity. Um, we're also pumping it with a lot of glues so that it's incredibly strong. Maybe a analogy for this is sort of Botox architecture where we're pumping in materials so they last as long, they don't age, just freeze, stay still, be inert. And in the end, we're having sort of carbon emissions and all sorts of other environmental impacts that um, are worse than the status quo, you know, relative like timber, for example. And the last dilemma, um, which is not something I ever anticipated to work on was to really take a, um, a somber look at, you know, what really, um, are we left with when we look at the end of our material life cycles? If you go to a landfill today, you'll see the dom dominance of plastics and textiles, paper products, um, none of which are necessarily, at least in plastics and textiles, um, particularly synthetic textiles are not bio-based, um, but they form a huge material resource on the planet today. And so, um, this sort of you know, understanding around how long these materials are gonna take to de degrade, um, as well as the sheer scale of, of what we're producing as part of our um, contemporary lifestyles, um, sort of caused us to evolve, you know, not just to look at where do materials come from. In many cases, that's sort of the, the low hanging fruit, even though there's a lot of work being done to improve these materials. If we only focus on the sourcing, we're gonna end up with just as big a problem at the very end of these life cycles. Um, even if we design it in a circular way, we're ignoring a huge um, pile of materials. And so the concept um, of soil sisters, which is the title of my lecture today, is, is really to think about where are these materials going? Um, and so this concept of return is as much environmental as it is social. And it's sort of what gave rise to um, what Nadia described as generative justice, which is a real look at the fact that everything of value that we produce on the planet today is extracted from our ecology. Um, and its value is, is amplified or transformed through labor systems, um, whether um, farmers or in factories. And a lot of that value is sequestered by some type of owner, um, whether it's corporation or the state. and so whether it's capitalism or socialism, there is a large scale accumulation of capital by a very small group. And consumers who buy this gain some of that value, um, but they have no idea, right, of this um, larger life cycle framework in terms of what and who has affected uh, the things they consume. And we have a lot of waste at the end. And so this concept of alienated value, whether that's land that has been continuously um, grown from, it's nutrients extracted um, at rates that outpace its restoration or regeneration, um, labor systems that do not get anywhere close to the amount of value in terms of their labor that they put, put into transforming our materials, uh, consumers again who are alienated from its, their production um, generation mechanisms, whether that's labor or the land, and this huge amount of waste. All of these are forms of alienated value, which are part of this top-down extraction um, of value that's been alienated from you know, those earlier generation mechanisms. Um, and as an architect, as a designer, I think we've spent a lot of time in this area up here in Orange, where in many senses, we are driving that engine of extraction somewhere between the owners and consumers. And a lot of the projects that we work on today is really at the bottom half of this graph, looking at ways that architects might actually occupy different positions um, as part of generative justice economies, working with materials, byproduct residues. Um, we call them waste because we haven't found a function for them or pollutants because they're materials in the wrong place and wrong time. Um, or with groups like consumers or other forms of interesting social enterprises in order to return value. Um, so this idea of generative is this bottom-up creation of value and justice has to do with the circulation, at least of a more equitable system of value distribution. So um, I'd love to you know, talk about three projects because um, I know we're constrained with time. 
um, that have sort of emerged from expanding this vocabulary of different types of soil sister materials. Um, the first I'm gonna talk about is non-toxic circularity. So how do we design um, eliminating a lot of toxic elements, um, particularly glues um, and other types of processing methods that might increase the amount of pollution that we receive at the end of our materials life. Carbon storage, which has to do with that, that steady state where we have materials that are actually brought into the building, um, stored there in their lifetime in the building, they actually um, serve huge value in terms of environmental and social performance. Regenerative farming, which I'm not gonna talk a ton about, but I'll talk a little bit about it because it has to do with mycelium. Um, and I know there's active work here going on with mycelium, which I'm really excited to see this afternoon. And lastly, the most challenging, which is the material bank. And so if we have materials like plastics um, and um, textiles made from synthetics or whatnot, there is no other way to actually get rid of these materials um, in uh, an efficient way without, you know, burning is, is one way of doing it, but we might need to dilute them if we take them into the building fabric, we might figure out ways to integrate them in safe ways. Um, and we buy ourselves time in terms of, um, you know, technologies that can actually enable its safe degradation or continued use in the building life cycle. So uh, the non-toxic soil sister products uh, kind of began with my um, PhD research. And it really started to look at the intersection of materials coming from farming and into the building. It began with coconuts. Um, and uh, over the last two decades, we've seen a boom in uh, coconut products. Jessica Alba with her coconut water has a lot of power. So many people consume coconut water as a health fad, coconut oil, coconut milk, coconut butter. I could go on, you know, like that scene in Forrest Gump with the shrimp. I have so many um, coconut products that everybody keeps sending me. But, you know, one of the things we realized is you know the emergence of every superfood um, comes with um, sort of a signal around a cyclical agricultural crisis happening somewhere else in the world. And um, in in the case of the coconut, this is along the equator where you know the prevalence of coconut trees and some areas in the subtropics generate a ton of um, husk waste, um, sort of the underbelly of that superfood. Um, these materials are incredibly high in bulk de density, very strong. Um, and so in places like where I'm from in Ghana, it's actually legal to put um, the husk into the municipal waste system because they end up ruining the compaction machines in, in landfill sites. And so coconut traders who actually sell coconut water in the city um, have resort to at the end of the week or the day, um, burning their piles illegally at night typically in the city. Um, and so in this project, um, in this research project, positioning the architect um, in collaboration with coconut traders, and coconut traders are a huge advocate here, um, influencer in, the, in, this, in this system, and working with materials that would have otherwise um, end up in, in a landfill or burnt illegally. Um, over the course of you know, that research project as part of my PhD, we. Um, realize that there's always, um, you know, for a lot of fibrous, fiber-based materials, you know, you might get um, concrete or steel, um, mineral-based materials doing certain things, very specific things very well. With fibers, you have a thousand applications. They cut across fashion, textiles, buildings, um, ar architectural technologies like geotextiles. And so there's always a spectrum of transformation pathways for these materials. And there's always a trade-off. Do you make something stronger by compressing it with you know, heat and pressure? And you can get boards that are as strong as oak with coconut husk, or do you actually keep it to more low density um, fibrous materials with high surface areas um, like the pith um, and the fibers, which are very good at absorbing water or nutrients, typically used for hydroponic applications. You can also combust it into activated carbon under controlled conditions and get the most efficient form of activated carbon. Almost everything we manufacture today uses activated carbon from coconuts in order to sequester really small pollutants and keep you know, sort of the purity in our manufacturing processes. 
And so um, this research with uh, coconut boards um, sort of opened up this um, biodiverse framework for making bio-based materials in an unexpected way. When we first got um, coconut husk, which when you separate, you get the fibers and you get this dust-like substance called the pith. If you bring them together in the right temperature and pressure paths, it melts, the pith melts into a very, very strong glue, creating a, a very dense uniform matrix. However, we were getting coconut pith from coconuts in Ghana, which is a very mature industry. So they're older coconut trees and the husks are actually, the coconuts are actually grown for the coconut oil industry. So the husks are older, much higher contents of lignin. There's something also about the temperature and humidity patterns in Ghana, at least on the West Coast that generated an extremely strong board. Um, although it's sort of shown here as close to pine, we had products that we could not replicate that were close to oak. Um, but when we were back in, in school um, prototyping, we got coconuts from India and Sri Lanka. They import, they export to the United States at uh, pretty affordable prices. And those are very different coconuts. So no coconut is ever created equal. And we found out the hard way, we could we could get boards that were um, not as strong and probably close to MDF. And so standardizing and ensuring quality control so we don't have variable coconut boards all the time if we're trying to make a building material, we started to look at emerging bio binders that were available in upstate New York. Um, so soy protein is a byproduct again from a huge um, uh, uh, crop industry now um, and fungal mycelium. So these are the alternative binders where you can kind of see in, in yellow the, the soy and then in orange the mycelium, which is variable performance, um, but you get more low density products. Um, we also did a lot of work understanding, you know, the actual structure of these materials, the pith and the fibers. Um, and the fact that these two components have such high surface areas, it's almost like a maze within them. And so they have this wonderful capacity to sorb moisture and pollutants from our building environments, indoor and outdoor streams. Um, and what's wonderful about that, and we, we, this is probably a phenomenon um, we experience when we're under a thatch fibrous roof, is that all of the water, particularly during the humid parts of the day and the late hours of the evening, earlier hours of the morning, are taken in, sucked in by these soggy fiber materials, coconut fiber materials. And it's that moisture at the peak of the day when it's incredibly hot that takes all the heat and evaporative cooling happens after that. So you have this moisture buffering and this cooling effect that happens um, with coconut uh, fiberboard products that have this double capacity for reducing um, loads on the building. And so you kind of see here the breathing of moisture across the surface of the coconut fiberboard um, in these graphs. We also initially were making most of these materials out of pure coconut, so coconut pith, coconut fibers, and we got a very heavy panel, super heavy. And uh, you know, when you have heavy materials, it's not just transport, but also adds loads to the building. And we also couldn't get consistent ones. And so one of the things we started to do was to look at a layered approach to, to these materials, almost like a Kit Kat where you would actually just localize the use of coconut or jute textiles um, infused with soy binders on the ex exterior parts of the panel. Those take on abrasion, mechanical loads, use the materials uh, at least efficiently where they will perform best. And in the middle, you'll actually get this sort of corn fed mycelium, fantastic for improving insulative uh, performance, thermal and acoustic. Um, and so this sort of prototype is very much a collaboration of a range of materials from soy to corn to coconut. And in, in the interior, we actually used a lot of recycled jute bags from agriculture. So this, in summary, you know, um, there's sort of these real opportunities for us as designers to really show the high value applications within this generative justice system. So as opposed to downcycling or premature combustion, there is the ability to embed value from a flat panel to an acoustic panel to an environmental module so that you're getting a ton of more profit to circulate within a wider ecosystem. 
And the fact that you can use the same amount, the same mass of material, but embed, you know, through geometry and form, all these other performance, whether thermal and acoustic, air quality remediation, is part of that value generation piece. It's also expanding the ecosystem of who becomes part of the building material life cycle from waste managers, coconut traders, owners of buildings, um, also seeing the land as a stakeholder or actor within the system. This is where we have a lot of work to do in terms of valuing the different ranges of economic, cultural, social capital associated with each of these actors. Um, and that can form a, a sort of basis for us determining how to circulate that value within these new bio-based economies. Uh, the second project I wanted to talk about is very much a response to, I would say a failure in, in the coconut research. Um, in many ways it was um, successful, but we realized that thermal pressing of bio-based materials, particularly in, in, in uh, some certain contexts in the global south, including Ghana, relies heavily on a very consistent energy infrastructure um, you need high embodied energy aluminum molds like the one you saw, a reliable supply of electricity. And after working in a coconut factory for a year, that never happens. I can't cover the number of times where, um, you know, we'll be in the middle of, middle of pressing and the electricity goes out and we, we sort of make our own coconut flavored margaritas and wait. Um, but it sort of got me thinking around how do we do this in a low energy, non-toxic fashion? And how do we also start to expand the number of crops that we're relying on um, due to the fact that Ghana's coconut industry was actually um, you know, um, collapsing in a sense because a lot of coconut farms were becoming rubber farms because it was more lucrative. And so this is where um, you know, looking at mycelium, which we stumbled across due to quality control issues became an inspiration. Um, fungi have for a long time um, ushered many different species onto different ecologies, plants onto land. Um, they help return all of our bodies back to the earth and cycle them through um, their interesting mechanisms. And, you know, looking at this particular strain of, of fungi, Ganoderma mycelium, which was found in an upstate New York forest. Um, wow, that's awkward. Okay, we're going to move past that for a second. But it can digest any type of lignocellulosic material, any biomass that has cellulose sugars within it. And that means it can typically digest a much wider inventory of materials um, to generate um, sort of a low density product. And we can make use of our conventional sort of tools for milling um, molds, um, thermoforming them into grow trays and creating you know, pretty customized panels. We can grow stuff also into the biomass mix, um, things that are used for assembly um, you know, in, in our buildings. Um, but a lot of the work, I came to the mycelium work pretty late, I would say. Um, and I was quite interested in, in the idea of mycelium as a vehicle for democratizing access um, and helping people to use waste closer to where it's produced, whether it's in your house or in an urban farm or a community kitchen. And so a lot of this work is actually with urban farms around um, Europe and in the States. Um, the first exhibition we did looking at distributed forms of producing microcomposites was with Reba, with Royal Institute of British Architects, where um, we essentially had a, a growing, growing workshops throughout the city where um, multi-generational participants from middle school all the way to elderly urban farmers participated in growing um, mycelium composites um, from their urban farm, a wonderful urban farm called Squash Nutrition. Um, we also did this in high schools um, where they were generating waste and developing these like really small um, human scale grow, grow, grow it yourself kits is what Ecovative calls them. And so it's human scale, you can lift it. Um, we use additional nutrients like flour, which many of you use in your workshops and creating, you know, using very simple waste wood um, opportunities to lip and help with assembly of these materials. So we had a sort of mycelium construction site in the middle of the gallery 
um, and it grew over five days and was used to install a tunnel um, at the entrance of the gallery um, to show sort of that this could be built right on site. Reba, the building was incredibly new and they were very, very not happy with growing mycelium there. And so we had to have a HEPA filter too in the, in the chamber so nothing in uh, went out. Um, our collaborators were as asbestos company, so they know how to deal with that well. Um, and it, that project sort of carried on to um, a research group at Atelier Luma in the south of France, where they have um, almost 40% of all of France's organic crops are grown in this region, incredibly biodiverse. Um, it's a wonderful biodiversity hotspot. And we sort of did a mapping of um, all of their major crops, um, everything from rice to rosemary to lavender to olives, um, um, as well as food waste. Here we really expanded from agriculture to look at these um, community kitchens that generated quite a nice scale of, of, of waste from their farms as well as their kitchen. And in doing so, um, try to understand, can we mix and match so if something like coconut doesn't have a ton of sugars, could we pair that with something like hemp that has enough nutritional content for mycocomposite production? And this mix and match is important for the work that we do so that we can actually align the seasonal cycles of, of growing and not always rely on, on one or two crops and still achieve some level of um, understand, like within limits of whatever the application is, whether it's insulation or low density boards. Um, the most successful are actually lemon peels um, and um, juicy, which is an invasive species that grows in the wetlands there. Um, and through that, we developed a hierarchy of, of myco um, modules, which was installed in one of the community kitchens. So all of the, um, primary panels were grown with the staple crop that was produced and more experimental, smaller scale microcomposites were grown from food waste um, or anything they were exp experimenting with from lemon to lavender to olive, rosemary. Um, we also, um, at the same time I was doing that research at Talia Luma, we also were running a studio back at RPI where we were trying to figure out how to reduce um, you know, the use of these um, high density plastic grow trays, which, you know, it's a very um, scientific um, material economy. We have a lot of plastics, a lot of gloves, a lot of alcohol. It's a sterile environment. And so we started to look at everyday objects, got um, a donation from Home Depot, tons of buckets. Um, and we're st starting to grow sort of cylinders and understanding what types of cylind cylindrical geometries do we get and get really efficient growth. As you can see, it's not always the same. Um, and how do we assemble that using um, a ton of small connections um, to transfer loads um, through these pretty good um, materials that deal with compression. Um, we use recycled wood, recycled uh, electrical wire um, to join them. And from that studio, we also flipped it into an installation in a beach forest where honey mushrooms were grown in, um, in Arnhem in the Netherlands. So this is a collaboration with a colleague, Gustavo Kremvel at RPI. And the last project is something that we've been doing um, that now begins to engage textile waste, um, textile um, waste from landfills, as well as textile waste water from the process of dyeing. Um, this particular project, um, you know, was done with my students at Yale, where we traveled to Ghana over the summer last year, and we worked with a fantastic foundation called the OR Foundation um, in Ghana. Ghana is the world's second largest importer of, of, of used clothing, primarily from the UK and the United States. And um, one of the things we were looking at is, you know, how can we actually take shredded textiles and develop a range of building materials or furniture products? And so our students worked with um, their trainees and actually part of the textile, secondhand textile trade relies on young women actually being able to carry a lot of these textiles on their head to sell in, on, in the market or nearby stores and are typically carrying more than twice their body weight which causes a ton of problems with their spine. 
And so part of the OR's mission, if you haven't heard of them, they're fantastic and they're really leading the way with slow fashion um, policy work around the world is to take these young women out of, you know, um, tr you know, carrying these loads and trading and introduce them into this program where they're actually becoming part of upcycling these um, textiles for a range of applications, including building materials now. Um, and they're also in, engaged in chiropractic pro uh, programs, which basically enable them to at least um, maintain the health of their spines. You can never regenerate the health of your spine. Um, and so you can kind of see here a process which has evolved from thermally pressing to just drying and using, um, as opposed to synthetic glue, um, they're using cassava-based glue, um, which creates a really relatively strong board and just hand pressing and then drying in these sort of large scale sheets, four by eight sheets to develop these fiber boards. And so part of the work that, you know, some of my students did was to develop a range of furniture. Um, you can kind of see these were molds that were made, you know, for chairs and tables and other types of homeware um, over the course of a week. Um, so very accessible. Um, and was very much done, you know, sort of a co-design in, in, in collaboration with the young apprentices at the OR Foundation. Um, in some cases, we weaved, you know, the, the, the cotton instead of shredding and drying into fiber boards, they're woven and also integrated into furniture. Um, behind um, them, they also built a range of um, earth masonry blocks, non-fired compressed blocks that were um, integrated agricultural residues to improve their strength, but also help with hygroscopic performance. And we also looked at a whole range of plants um, that could generate non-toxic color. Um, and we're actually able to get the full color spectrum from just 10 plants, um, as well as some soil dyes. Uh, I'll end on this project because this is very much ongoing, but it's been something I've been working on for the last eight years. And it's really looking at um, this fantastic company called Global Mamas based in Ghana. Um, they work with women who have home-based enterprises, women who basically make high quality tie and dye textiles at home and are part of a distributed economy that is both domestic and they export to the United States and Germany. Um, one of the things, you know, this, this sort of group has had to encounter over the years, they began with six women and now they're, you know, at one point we're over 600, was the women began to come together to produce textiles in urban areas. And coming together to dye also generates a ton of toxic textile wastewater. And so the local EPA in Ghana came down on them to treat their wastewater um, before, you know, entering the municipal systems. And so, you know, the textile wastewater is filled with a ton of stuff, heavy metals, um, that alter the pH of water, have a ton of um, toxic chemicals, which, you know, affect everything from, you know, the smell in, in, in the sewage systems, as well as, you know, microbial um, life, you know, and water bodies that they eventually meet. And so relative to what was available on the market, they're typically working with aluminum and iron-based um, flocculants. So a flocculant is like a chemical that, you know, when it mixes with um, a wastewater stream. It makes all the bad stuff, heavy stuff, clamp together and settle. And we looked at an alternative from a, a rising super crop called Moringa, which was is primarily produced for tea and now oil, um, now cosmetic pro products in Whole Foods. This byproduct, the Moringa press meal, is sort of like a flour, and it, we discovered through a number of experiments, it's a fantastic flocculent. Um, you can kind of see what happens, you know, in the course of four minutes by stirring the right um, recipe and mixture of Moringa with one of the most toxic dye recipes they have. It's almost blue-black water. And you can kind of see all of the toxic set settlements diluted. So they're mixed with the press meal, but the water is incredibly clear. So after a year of research, we were able to uh, formulate the Moringa flocculent for effective treatment of their wastewater. Um, but we realized that it wasn't enough to just have a material technology if the actual practice of dyeing did not change. And so we worked with the mamas to really look at some of the problems that are associated with traditional dyeing, which is 
pretty much in this configuration where a lot of the fumes coming off of, you know, the dye bath in this bucket is actually inhaled by mother and child and tons of ergonomic problems. And so this development or design of this sort of dye station that takes into account all of the nuances of dyeing and how the women rest their hands and their spine health um, and how they actually tend to dye in pairs. They're never dying alone uh, was part of the, the dye station design. Um, we made use of scrap metal as well as poly tanks, which are you know small scale water storage um, containers that are found throughout the city, very easy to use. Essentially at the end of the week, they're sized so that all of the dye baths that are used throughout the week accumulate there. At the end of the day on Friday, you add the Moringa, mix it, you come back on Monday morning and you can actually release all of the clean water and collect the sludge. The sludge. So I wanna go back to the sludge because we always produce something that we may not necessarily have a use for and that is pollution. And so in the scale up of Global Mamas, uh, we worked with a colleague on the design of the new circular facility. And one of the things, and this is sort of a full circle moment is to think about the sludge as also a resource. This is now a diluted sludge material, not as toxic as it was in a, in a dye bath because it's now diluted with Moringa, which has um, chemistry that is actually fine to be around. Um, and then looked at, its role in terms of forming rammed and compressed earth bricks, um, you know, in sort of larger thermally massive walls. And so I'll end here with this diagram, um, which really, you know, talks about, you know, at least three permutations of where architects or designers can begin to position themselves working with a new material inventory, um, considering a new set of co-designers in the process of producing building materials. And also in many ways trying to form, and this is a larger project, but trying to form new relationships of connecting how people um, consume materials and that relationship back to who produces and um, what ecologies produce these materials. Um, so that relationship is something that for many of us we've lost, right? In terms of you know, our understandings or even care for who and what actually produce the things and buildings that we live in. And that is very much a critical part of the generative justice project. So I'll end there and open it up to questions. All right, very good. Well, um, hands up if you've got a question and I will bring you the mic. Oh, wow. Yeah, you got to think about it a little while. <laughs> well, Blaine, looks like he has a question. Thank you. I've, I've got many questions, but uh, first, mainly, thank you so much for being here and for sharing this fantastic research. Would you, would, this is a very compelling proposal, and it, it makes so much sense. Uh, I, I, translating I happen to think about, you know, thinking sort of ecosystemically about the architect's role as as moving from, let's say, a kind of, you know, key predator position to maybe a scavenger position or something, but uh, which may be a bad analogy. But I'd I'd love for you to walk us through a little bit more of what how the role needs to shift, right, for architects to. Like, what does that look like in terms of practice for you, in terms of having a closer relationship to, uh, yeah, waste recycling facilities or like, how does the kind of day-to-day -day practice shift as a result? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And um, in many ways, my education and practice is sort of prototyping that. Um, I think it's, you know, first of all, being able to look around rather than just ahead, in the famous words of Ursula Le Guin. Um, we're surrounded by so many material resources that we don't necessarily value. And for me, this was a sort of come to Jesus moment during my PhD, because as Jefferson knows, where's Jefferson? 
uh, when I started off at Case, um, I was working on this dynamic daylighting system, super advanced, um, amazing for ad advertisements, solar, passive solar control. And I remember thinking this technology will never make it to places that I eventually want to practice in. And I was home visiting and saw literally as I was buying coconut water, the husk material accumulating. And I remember thinking, my God, like there are, there's so much coconut husk and that's symptomatic of a range of um, large scale farming in the country. Ghana is the world's largest producer of co chocolate, cocoa. And that's a resource that one can work with. Again, you know, if you just think about, I don't know if during COVID you looked at the amount of waste you're producing on an individual level, it's it's a lot, but actually when you think on a block scale and a community scale, urban farms, you're actually producing a ton of waste. And so I think looking around at materials and actually thinking, what did this material have to do, you know, in its first life that might be useful somewhere in the building? Um, because there is um, design principles about where and how we put them into buildings that can have disastrous effects or again, celebrate all of that intelligence. And the other thing I think, um, you know, that I, I'm really excited about is, you know, it's in a, kind of an entrepreneurial stance in the industry. I think architects have had a ton of impact when they can actually affect the way their materials are produced. And we have a lot of knowledge of, the, of that. And um, I think this is where, you know, looking to, in upstate New York, we had a ton of collapsed huge manufacturing companies like Xerox, Kodak. And they were actually our collaborators for, you know, a lot of the manufacturing of our initial, initial co coconut fiberboard prototypes. So there's that skill. It may not necessarily be in the same industry, but there's a lot of transfer. And I see that happening in Ghana where you saw the, the textile workers, a lot of the workers that are employed as technicians came from metal scrap industry, electronic waste. And a lot of those principles are carried over and so I think it's trying to find these new alliances around, you know, the production of our materials. And to some extent, there is upskilling, of course, um, that might be able to introduce a new model, you know, for, for, um, for producing. Um, as a designer and an architect, I think it's also forced us to not just look at the bottom up, in terms of materials, but also the top down. So how do we start to do more policy work, which is why the UNEP global report was so key, um, because we know there's a ton of barriers around which materials can you use, who owns it, um, fire and mold are the biggest barriers to using these materials. So unless we start also working with policy, professional institutions, AIA, Architecture 2030, um, UNEP, Global ABC, we're actually not going to see that that huge acceptance of these materials. So, I guess it's um, you know it's a journey, but I think there's I think the wonderful wonderful thing about this is that there is access, you know, if there's the desire. And I think you know I'm seeing this in you know the students I teach and young professionals. There is that desire and hunger, you know, for having more agency in what we build with. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> it can be any type of question, honestly. Okay, I see one there. Okay. Yeah. All right. And as always, please give us your name and what program year, all that fun stuff. Hi, my name is Hillary. I'm a second year. And I was wondering when it comes to using biomaterials like coconut pith, you discussed that you wanted to use it and optimize it for its ability to absorb and release moisture. Over time, are there concerns that it changes the performance of the material itself? Mechanically, you mean? Yeah. Or otherwise? Like um, for structure and weight and things like that when using it in building materials. Yeah, so um, mechanically, no, I mean, the kind of like expansion and contraction as you're absorbing moisture is so minimal. Um, but there is, um, I think, for those of you who worked with Jefferson in, in the green wall research, the better the filter, the more clogged it gets, quicker, right? Um, so you do have that phenomenon, which is um, 
you know, can be a problem if you're relying on that for hygroscopic performance. And so it's, there's sort of a, a really interesting spectrum around how dense do we need this material to be? And how can we introduce a design framework where we actually could remove, you know, the soggy math that's doing all the hygroscopic uh, performance at much faster life cycles than the one that is, you know, essentially offering structure. And so we did have an iteration of that prototype that's almost like a razor blade. So, you know, you remove the layer that's doing um, intrinsic evaporative cooling, you know. Um, but, you know, we've had these coconut panels in um, a pretty saline, hot, humid environment on the coast. It's been over 10 years and essentially they're, they're like wood, you know, I would say shade it, prevent it from essentially being kept moist for so long, because if it's not able to dry out, that's when you have problems. Um, but varnish it from time to time and they're fantastic. Treat it as you would wood, you know. Um, with the stuff with mycelium, as those of you who've worked with mycelium, fantastic with fire. It forms a sort of layer that pre prevents oxygen from getting in. Um, but yeah, you know, color-wise, it's very stable because the coconut has, you know, has to deal with, it was trained that way, right? It's on a coast, it's dealing with high heat, moisture, salt, all the while nurturing the coconut water, coconut copra inside it's primed, you know, to last, you know, for a long time and not change appearance, yeah. All right, let's see, raise your hand again. So you're here, okay. Hi, my name is Brianna and I'm a first year. Um, my question was like, when you did your research um, and you were trying to figure out like what products to use in order to um, kind of figure out what materials to build with, it's like very rooted in the culture of the area. So how did you start your research? Huh. Um, I guess it varies across a range of, you know, the range of materials, but um, it's a great question. Moringa, you know, I remember when I was young, my, my dad telling me that when, when they were young, they would, after eating meals, they would put the Moringa leaves in, you know, a basin with water and they would just submerge their hands there. That was their soap. And I remember thinking, wow, does, does Moringa have some type of cleaning properties that, you know, I didn't know about. So that was a clue from something that they used to do, they no longer do. And I think often with a lot of these materials, the clues are from how we've used them in the past, you know, coconut fibers for thatching um, or other types of, you know, woven applications, geotextiles, you know. Um, I think with, um, frankly, I rely on a lot of like local knowledge. My Mason who's worked with me for 15 years is a secret botanist. Uh, literally like, you know, we will be walking on a site. He's like, oh, do you happen to pee in bed at night? Mix that, wow, okay. Mix that <laughs> plant with that plant and, and drink that. Sorry, what's happening? Uh, is there something happening? Did I call somebody? Do I? Thank you. We're good. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Okay. Oh my God. Uh, we're good. Thank you. So yeah, you know, we're like relying on local knowledge. Um, I think other times, for example, with mycelium, every time I brought mycelium from Ecovative, which is what you usually work with, to Ghana, I would mold. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, we probably need to use strains who have been nurtured in this environment and like certain biomass from this environment. 
And um, a mycologist that is doing research at CSI in Ghana, um, we were walking through the forest and he showed me a strain that grows on this very specific part of the palm frond, never gets infected um, and likes a whole host of, of, you know, residues from crops that are grown around there. And I remember thinking, you know, again, it's this looking around, you know, um, and talking to people who've spent a lot of time looking around. Um, and so those are sort of clues, you know, um, that help activate, you know, um, you know, where it could go potentially. And sometimes it's a surprise, but uh, often there are clues already. We've built with these materials for thousands of years. I think now we're, we're asking these materials to come into a 21st century building sector where performance is very different. We build very differently. And so it's causing us to revalue and rethink around how do we design and value all parts of these, these materials. And so that's where I think it's interesting, you know, in terms of, I don't know, the color of mass timber has been a problem for me for a long time. It's like this Scandinavian light brown and super antiseptic and clean. And, you know, you can say that for a lot of like material, biomaterials, there's a shade of brown, right? And maybe you char it and it's black. Um, sometimes that, that can be a, a barrier. People want to customize. We're so used to brilliant colors all over, you know, our fashion and our buildings. And so how do we create aspirational, um, you know, ways of, of designing with these materials? And um, that causes us to look again in, in, you know, into other types of materials. How have we colored in the past and how is it different today? Um, and so that activated a lot of the research right now we're doing around color, which um, unfortunately I didn't talk a lot about, but, um, you know, it's really looking at both mineral and combinations of plants to produce a range of colors, you know, so. Yeah, it's kind of diverse, but um, I, I would say mostly it's clues from the past and, and also thinking how to innovate with tech today's criteria. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Ethan. I'm a, I'm a first year. Um, a lot of these uh, bio-based materials seem to be working well on a, uh, on a smaller scale right now. What needs to be done to get these to start being used on a, on a larger scale? I mean, timber scaled up big time, right? Um, so that's not small scale. Bamboo's also scaling in a big way. Um, we've seen like a ton of international standards helping us figure out how to specify it, standardize, you know, its mechanical performance and whatnot. Um, for a whole host of other biomass, um, one of the biggest problems, as I sort of mentioned, is quality control. Um, we, particularly in this country, don't have a mature agricultural industry that cares about how we process waste, um, agricultural waste. And so um, that quality control, like hemp in upstate New York is, you know, becoming a thing actually all over the states, right? But we have our hemps mixed up with all these other stuff from the farm. And um, until we actually spend time investing in the quality control, it's just too expensive. So frankly, when I was working at Ecovative, they were importing their hemp from Netherlands. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to say that out loud, but okay, that's now out in the open. I think people know that. Um, uh, corn, we were working with corn. It was much cleaner, but uh, not as um, standard in terms of you know the strength and quality as, as hemp from the Netherlands. Um, the other has to do with scale, right? Like. And this is sort of the dilemma I'm facing is, you know, if we're if you start a coconut or a sugar wheat company, you know, and you're relying on scaling to meet the demand, you know, you get a, a large client like Google. They literally bankrupted a, a partner of ours because, you know, they didn't they could not scale. Even Ecovative cannot scale fast enough, you know, to meet the demand. Um, and so for me, this is how do you pair a multi crop inventory? You know, so you have a flexible uh, material resource stream for a specific product and, and, and use that as a plus. Like you actually have a ton of customization options for, you know, a broader inventory. So it's the, the, the materials that are in season, building materials that are in season. Scale and quality control are huge, but um, that's a supply side. And even if we get the supply side, the demand is where we need a lot of work, right? 
we cannot underestimate what it's going to take to shift people's preferences around these materials. And this is kind of where um, I, you know, feel like we need to do a ton of work again to to help people identify and love these materials. It's nothing more to it. Um, and so here, I think customization is one. But can these materials open up new ways of living? Like I think a lot about smell. You know, we're very used to antiseptic, very clean smells and um, the smells that come along with these materials are things that we're no longer used to, right? Or we don't like anymore. Fungi, for example, I don't know if I mentioned this to Jonathan, but um, BMW almost replaced their insulation, car insulation with mycelium as part of their going green thing, but didn't because of smell. Everybody likes the new car smell, which is like VOCs blasting in our faces and it's luxury, right? Who doesn't like the smell of a new car? It's just psychologically matched with, you know, luxury. And mm, fungi in a hot, humid car, it's not bad, but it's not exactly, you know, associated with something desirable. Um, and so I think, you know, there's a whole range of sensory, you know, performance, you know, that I think could help shift you know the demand for these materials and just this idea that people um know about what's in their in their their built environment so once people know what's in their materials like you know what's in your food you make different choices right and so i think that's part of also a burden that designers have to also take on you know as part of huge influencers and in getting these materials um normalized yeah Thank you. Let's see. Okay. Like, who's going to go from there next? Or not yet? Here and then we'll pass it down. So. Um, hi, I'm um, I'm Ethan, a uh, third year uh, undergrad. Um, I, I'm actually I'm really um appreciated this talk because it's very um relevant to what we're doing right now um in our um um semester with our theme of um sustainability and like integrating that into the building design with materials and systems and things like that um what i was interested about is since since it is going to take a while for a policy to accept these new um materials and ideas into like the new um uh, building systems and things like that. Um, what are some ways that you might think we could like rethink or almost like remix the ways that we currently use like the most prominent like mineral based materials like concrete and steel um, and like other kinds of like a really big um, materials currently that are contributing the most to the climate crisis? Like, for, like what are some ways that we could like rethink how we use those um, that are currently so prevalent in order to actually prevent the climate crisis, Absolutely. I guess. Yeah, no. Oh, my God. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, you know, part of the agony of doing that global report on all building materials was that it showed us that probably the people or the actors who are actually going to help make this shift are the con conventional material players. So for example, the cement um, and concrete masonry industry will be the biggest advocate for a shift to, I would say, bio-based and earth, non-fired earth compressed masonry. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, we actually need them even more than we realize because often, you know, in response to the last question, these materials need time to scale. Like think about how long it's taken concrete to scale or steel. And in some ways, we can actually take a lot of these bio-based materials, you know, the shredded fibers are fantastic supplements and cementitious uh, materials or admixtures that really help reduce the content of cement. So it's part of a green concrete value chain, but it also helps bring people into that industry. So we are improving the quality control and collection of these materials as we sort of shift and transition to maybe some proportion of earth, mason, earth masonry or greener concrete. 
Um, so that buying time is, is key. Um, a lot of our bio-based glues, you know, um, you know, I think could play a huge role in timber, the constituted wood products. So, you know, laminating timber, laminated timber products could be done with mycelium. Um, in the coconut fiber board, quite a large percentage of that panel's mass can be fungal mycelium as opposed to isocyanate, you know, chemicals, phenolic resins that are terrible at off-gassing VOCs. So, you know, they play a huge role. And I think we've got to stop kidding them against one another and actually see them as part of that process. At the moment, I feel like a lot of the um, thrust has been to basically burn biomass. Again, too fast. We aren't making, we're spending too much energy. There's too much water in them, you know, to burn them this early. And um, the Department of Energy came out a few months ago with this roads to removal, which was like, we have enough biomass, let's burn it to produce biofuels. Huge problem. And we've got to get in there and say, actually, you know, bring them into buildings and conventional building materials right now in the near term. And in the midterm, we can transition to green products that then could be burned at the end of their life. But, you know, this, this idea of taking biomass and using that as an alternative fuel source and in, in material production is low hanging fruit and is probably not an, an efficient, you know, approach. So they're very much, and I think we're sort of seeing, you know, the Sangovan and the Hall Sims as key collaborators, you know, in this, but um, it does affect their bottom line. So it's, um, yeah, it's tough, but they've got to think about how they're going to transition their workforce, you know, to green the industry. And so this could be part of it, but thank you. That was a great question. Thanks. Uh, hey, my name is Daniel. I'm a first year student. Uh, my question is like uh, these materials, like the bamboo, they're getting even more and more popular, and this also increased like the deforestation. So I wonder if is there is like any regulations or strategies to like that they're like using or applying to prevent like f like increasing like this kind of problematics because even though that there might be like a more sustainable materials if we use it in the same way we're using other materials this can cause like really a problem so I just wonder if you have research about anything like that yeah um Timber, I mean, you're talking about timber specifically, right? Yeah. Or, or all bio. Or like all bio. Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny because a lot of crops have uh, a relationship to timber that is is not necessarily um, uh, mutualistic, right? Like, so every time we're scaling up sugar plantations, the first thing we do is cut down all the trees, right? And every time we're growing trees, we eliminate all the other materials. So there's, um, with deforestation of timber in particular, um, we've seen, you know, in Canada, Scandinavia, and the United States, a ton of policies that are really focused on forest owners, right? That they're actually afforesting at rates that actually, um, you know, uh, reduce the impacts of deforestation. So there's finance, there's ways of actually classifying products that come from forests that are managed properly. So we've got a couple, you know, timber practices with afforestation, sustainable forest management, and that's happening. Um, there's also uh, a fantastic work going on at McGill, which is looking at how architects can actually design, you know, building products that support those those practices, sustainable forest management. So, for example, mass timber is really two or three species of trees, right? That's a monoculture, right? Um, can we start to look at other types of wood products harvested at specific times of the year and actually use them as conventional standardized materials, different dimensions, different looks, different performances. And so this is where design can actually play a leading role in actually specifying, you know, we want those types of materials with these credentials, you know, or um, certifications, I should say. Um, with biomass, I think it's less so, right? And so I think we've got to see, you know, the kind of work that is happening in the timber industry 
also take place in bamboo, which is again, beginning to see that same decrease in biodiversity um, as alongside you know, biomass. So we're getting a very bio, di a biodiverse inventory of, 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 of materials. Um, with biomass, I think there's a huge opportunity because you know, in crop rotation, we grow a certain cash crop, we have a cover crop, we have things that actually improve the soil before we plant another cycle. How again do we design building materials that take advantage of those cycles? And so that's where I feel like there's so much work to be done there because often what we're seeing is we're following the business model of, again, conventional building materials and that needs to, to shift. There's a fantastic book by Lindsay Wickstrom called Mass Timber Futures. If you have the chance to look at that book, it uh, covers a lot of really interesting work policy, new types of business models um, that really talk about, you know, afforestation and sustainable forest management in association with design. And, um, you know, so hopefully that'll be a good resource, but. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, well, I've got one. Um, so when you're talking about, you know, uh, monoculture and particularly thinking about like industrial agriculture, um, and you, you mentioned something about corn, and I'm thinking more in terms of the United States, right? And a lot of our production, and I think corn is still the biggest crop in the US and, you know, grown in that room and, and is grown in a rotation, you know, with, with soybeans. Do you know? Um, has there been work done particular? I mean, have you done work in that area or are there others do looking at that? Because I know right now, you know, using corn for ethanol, for example, you know, is probably the biggest thing in addition to food production. But um, it would be interesting to be able to bring a system like that into the biomaterials kind of, you know, loop, let's say. I haven't worked on corn directly, although I'm writing about corn right now. Um, but it, corn is like this cautionary tale, you know, for, for, for a lot of the biomass that we're looking at, because, you know, as part of what happened in the First World War, there are a lot of these policies that subsidize uh, corn farmers. You know, if grow as much as you can, we will be your, your consistent client. We will buy this from you at an assured price. So it subsidized that industry in a big way. And there were huge unanticipated impacts of that, right? Um, first of all, there was so much surplus. America had so much corn in storage, it was insane. And what happens when you have that level of surplus? You begin to displace other things that the material was never supposed to be used for. So it wasn't just for food, we see it substituting sugar, the mother super crop, right? In fructose syrup, and all of a sudden our food pyramid, boom, sugar becomes a big thing, you know, in our diets, it's in everything. We can't avoid sugar and corn. We're practically sugar and corn chemically. <laughs> but um, uh, it's come to this point now where, you know, we use it for, again, sugar, but also biofuels. And I think most of our biomass will have to come to the situation where once we value every part of that plant, our building material application will also have to compete economically for getting as much value out of it as possible. And unfortunately, you know, corn fiber boards are no, not as desirable as corn biofuel or corn fructose, cheaper to produce, they've scaled. And so, I don't see a ton of, I think there was a huge company making corn um, particle board products at some point, they collapsed. Um, this actually happens a lot with biocomposite uh, companies that rely on one. And maybe there's just one season where they don't get a certain yield or quality and they go bust, or there isn't a market that's willing to accept it quickly enough and they go bust. Um, so, you know, I haven't seen a ton come out after that. I forgot the name of the company. Um, obviously, mycelium corn was one of their primary substrates 
Ecoveda for some time, but again, displaced by a much better agricultural residue like the hemp, you know, shives. So not a ton with corn. And um, I think if it's, if it's the example, I think we've also got to learn what might happen to all of these biomass that we're priming for the building industry, you know, once they scale, what are they better at doing? Um, I think about it also in terms of, you know, something I see happening with rubber um, in Ghana. Um, a lot of the coconut farms, as I mentioned, are now rubber farms. And um, we obviously want rubber, tapped, uh, the liquid tapped from the rubber tree, but we're realizing it's actually more efficient, or not we, certain places in, in Denmark are realizing that it's more efficient to cut the rubber tree prematurely, shred it and burn it as biofuels for recycling industries, which is crazy, you know, because rubber trees actually, once you plant a rubber plantation is very difficult for any other crop to ever grow because of its root structure. And so you essentially make the ecosystem quite infertile after planting rubber. But the fact that it's a lot of money quickly, there's a demand for biofuels in places like Denmark, and the like, that's now being displaced, you know, in terms of, you know, rubber, traditional rubber products, which is a huge problem. And so I think, you know, big takeaway, you know, learning from corn is how do we show that there's a huge value proposition in building products um, that can play a role in other, you know, life cycles. And the building life cycle is just one stop, very efficient and helps improve the quality of it for something else. And it's part of a sustainable management system, but it's not the end because it can easily be displaced by something else if we don't think of it that way. So I know that doesn't answer your corn, but it's just, I haven't seen a ton with corn. Yeah. yeah. No, but I, I was thinking, could there, maybe it's kind of like working backwards. Could you disrupt the, the you know, negative impacts of the of monocultural agriculture you know, and and working toward a more biodiverse way of producing, you know, at most, well, whether it's, you know, livestock feed or human, you know, all sorts of things. I just, I wonder if there's the, I, these loops, they remind me of Harvey, I don't know if any of you guys wow. in various classes have seen yeah. David Harvey's uh, cycles of capitalism, but, you know, production, like all of that is part of that. And so... The disruption of the practice might be a way to think about it. I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, we've been thinking about corn in the context of three sisters. Like, can we introduce beans and squash and actually think about, you know, um, other types of products that come out of that, whether they're dyes or textiles or, you know, building products and associated with food, um, so that we can slowly take away this hybrid corn introduce indigenous corn species alongside squash and beans and slowly restore, you know, the, the health of the soil over time. Um, so similar to the sort of timber products where we're specifying, you know, the design of certain products, the demand for them working backwards, you know, I think there's an opportunity. I haven't seen a project like that. I think that would be really interesting, but that's still for up for grabs, you know. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm a Mark II student. Um, I had a question, like, do you think maybe, like, the eventual end goal long-term solution is, like, the integration and co-working of different materials so we don't get, like, for now, I know we're expanding materials, but in the future to not get, like, oh, this material works better, and then we get new cash crops of coconuts or mycelium, like, in the end goal, would it be better to do bits of all the different materials so that they're kind of all on equal use level? Sorry, you're gonna have to repeat. Yeah, you I can. missed a few parts. Um, so I was thinking about when you mentioned the integration of like using like mycelium and concrete, mycelium and CLT, or same thing with coconuts, but to like kind of like not have another issue where we deforest mycelium or coconuts, that kind of thing. <laughs> like, do you think the angle would would be like the integration and co working of multiple materials to kind of keep them balanced? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, 
from a building perspective, I think there's certain materials that we cannot do away with. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of like primary structure in buildings. We will probably always rely on, at least if we're going up, steel and reinforced concrete. We could substitute, um, you know, certain types of, of aggregates for local stone or whatnot and improve the efficiency of foundation designs and material efficiency can really help there. But I think everything else can be faster moving biodiverse materials from thermal mass to insulation to interior finishings. Those could be, you know, um, these materials could do a lot of different things depending on the way we combine them. And I think that's a very place-based decision around what gets used. Um, and, and that could also be an opportunity for, you know, local economies. But um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, they all have equal, you know, performance value or, or whatnot. Yes, we value them, but I think it's, um, there's a matching of the materials to use and also a life cycle timing that I think is gonna be key if we wanna support or, or take on the biodiverse, you know, paradigm. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we are about at time and I don't see any more hands um, up and waving unless I'm wrong. So uh, let's thank uh, Mei Ling again for a great talk.